miraculous recoveries. Um, so this is uh, the uh, US labor market, and this is the pattern of um, uh, the length of time it takes for the number of jobs to recover after a recession. And what you see is that from the, in the early 80s, the early 90s, the early 2000s, and then again after the global financial crisis, the labor market has taken longer and longer to recover um, in the aftermath of a recession. This is the kind of statistical correlate to what, what economists have called jobless recoveries. But of course, um, this isn't only about people not being able to do work. It's also about the types of jobs that people are finding. Those jobs typically underemploying them in a variety of ways, not having uh, full-time work when they want it, getting work that pays less than jobs they used to have, or jobs that don't use their skills. And all of these forms of underemployment have contributed to a growing gap across the entire OECD between labor productivity and the average wage growth, and even more significantly between labor productivity and median wage growth. So the big question is, are these technological innovations and labor market trends connected? And how so? What is the connection between them? So one answer to that question has come from this vibrant new automation discourse, which is not only appearing as a set of books, coming from really across the political spectrum and including a variety of um, uh, you know, um, policymakers directly, you know, like for example, Andrew Yang, as well as um, economists and uh, futurists and union leaders and so on. And it's not only appearing as a series of books, it's really proliferating um, across uh, scholarly articles, newspapers, and magazines. And those um, texts within the automation discourse really provide a technological account, or what I think of as a pure technology story. Basically, what they do is they take uh, a variety of technologies and they try to array them or uh, arrange them on a single axis um, between aut automation technologies on the right hand side and augmentation technologies on the left hand side. The basic idea is that augmentation technologies improve the productivity of workers but keep them in their jobs, whereas automation technologies replace them. There's a real lack of consensus about this technological account. Um, an initial study originally published in 2013, the so-called Oxford Martin study, said that 47% of jobs today are at a high risk of automation. They provided no time framework. They just said, given current technologies, 47% could technically be automated. Further studies by the OECD, MIT, and so on have revised this and say actually only 14% of jobs today are at a high risk of automation, with the rest of them more likely to be augmented rather than automated. I'd be happy to talk about that. But what I want to focus on here is that researchers have long cast doubt on this pure technology story. They've said that the ways that technologies are actually implemented in production depend on a variety of social factors. Sometimes those technologies are implemented in ways that actually improve workers' autonomy, where autonomy is understood as self-directed work, the ability to use skills that one's mastered and feeling a purpose among a variety of other things. And of course, a large uh, research um, body has connected these kind of feelings of autonomy to um, uh, worker solidarity and workers' bargaining power, as well as the larger labor market and um, other social institutional uh, frameworks. So um, opposing autonomy, of course, to alienation. And what we've seen is that alongside the growth of this automation discourse, we've had a whole range of social science and social studies investigations of the actual digital economy. Publications like Alex Rosenblatt's Uberland, which looks at you know, what actually is happening in these um, uh, rideshare services. What kinds of experiences are workers having? Are they actually becoming more autonomous with algorithmic management? Or are, is algorithmic management actually furthering their precarity and so on. Um, Ghost Work by Mary Gray and Siddhar Suri uh, looks at the kind of hidden forms of work behind apparently automated processes. So looking at, uh, for example, content moderation on platforms like Facebook and showing how much labor is actually going into things that on the screen appear to just be happening as it were through artificial intelligence. Now, a lot of these social um, uh, scientific studies kind of place technologies today in, in this, these sort of quadrants of the, of the two axis um, 
uh, graph I've shown you, that for the most part, technologies are alienating rather than uh, autonomy enhancing in character, whether they're augmenting or automating in character. Um, and my argument is that there's a missing variable here. We're talking typically about technology and about you know, social and legal infrastructures, but the missing variable here is the macroeconomic context. And to start to get at this, we can you know, refer to um, something Juliet Shore said in a recent piece she published in Theory and Society. She said, the platform economy must be partially understood in relationship to the general labor market. In the early days of her research, she and her associates found that many providers opted for platform work because they were unable to find conventional employment in the wake of the Great Recession. And she also points out in that same study that in 2018, 2019, when the US labor market was tightening, um, there was a question about the end of the platform economy because more and more workers were choosing conventional labor, um, conventional jobs over platform jobs in a tighter labor market. And we can, of course, just think of this as a purely cyclical phenomenon. There's just a general macroeconomic relationship depicted here between um, the, the dotted line is the unemployment rate and the solid line is the nominal rate of wage growth. And of course, these are inversely correlated. When uh, unemployment is high, workers have less bargaining power and they can't ask for as much at work. They can't demand as much. When unemployment falls, workers have much more strength in the labor market. And there's a kind of cyclical relationship between those two variables. But what you don't see in a graph like this is the pattern over the course of business cycles. So a phenomenon that's been more widely discussed, although disputed in terms of its origins, is secular stagnation. Over the course of um, many business cycles since the 1960s, the average growth rate in the economy of this is of the OECD as a whole has fallen from about 5% per year to a little bit more than 1.5% per year. And that trend line, which I'm showing you there, doesn't even include the 2020 number. Um, I've kind of uh, removed that from the trend line to show the general um, pattern even before the pandemic, but the pandemic continues um, in many ways this pre-existing trend. My main argument is that slowing growth, not technological change, not an acceleration of the pace of technological change is what's causing the low demand for labor. In essence, a low labor demand encourages the digital economy to develop in ways that are alienating for workers because employers do not have to take workers' perspectives into account when making investment decisions. And this is a broadly true phenomenon and it interacts with social institutions in different ways. Now, Economists have presented a range of different explanations for this phenomenon. We, of course, have supply side explanations that focus on technological exhaustion, like Robert Gordon, and demand side explanations, famously associated with Larry Summers, talking about savings glut and so on, and a lack of investment. My explanation is somewhat different. I'm providing a social structural explanation that focuses on the transition from an industrial economy to a service economy. In my account, post-war economic uh, conditions made for um, not only technological advance, which has been the subject of a lot of the um, automation studies, but also technological diffusion. As more and more countries brought productive capacity online, that meant that global markets and industry and also agriculture became increasingly oversupplied, leading to declining rates of industrial investment and industrial expansion. And what that meant is that the industrial growth engine increasingly ran down and services fail to um, serve as a viable replacement because they are uh, suffer from endemically low productivity growth rates, a phenomenon associated with um, Baumol's cost disease. And the result therefore was a long-term stagnation of the economy and hence a weak demand for labor. So I'm just going to dive into some empirical um, uh, support for this thesis, looking at um, three high-income countries in particular, the US, Japan, and Germany, in the book, I talk about, I try my best to give an account of what's going on in the world economy. Um, I look at a range of medium and low income countries and I'd be happy to talk about that here, but you can also read about it in the book. And what I do is I focus first on manufacturing and there's a few reasons for that. I mean, it's really essential to my overall explanation, of course, but also manufacturing is um, a really easy sector to study the effects of automation. In. It's also a sector which um, the automation theorists often use as an example, like this is what's already happened and now we're gonna see it also in services. Uh, it's also just easy to measure. Here you see um, typical statistics, installed robots per thousand workers in manufacturing. And you can see 
see Germany, Japan, and the United States are toward the front of that pack. Important to note is that um, Eastern European manufacturing export countries and um, uh, European ones tend to be further to the front. The US is not the most automated among the advanced industrial countries. Also, as I already mentioned, um, this trend in industry has already been going on, as it were, one might say the job apocalypse in, in industry has already taken place. So that's why it's a good example for the automation theorists. And what you can see depicted here in a stylized way are waves of deindustrialization unfolding across the world. Deindustrialization started in the West in the most advanced economies, but then it uh, affected stepwise more and more countries across the world, even countries like Brazil and South Africa which hardly reached the levels of industrial employment um, uh, share that the rich countries had, have gone through a process that economists like Danny Roderick have labeled premature deindustrialization. And in fact, according to the UN, the entire world has been deindustrializing since 2013. So the question is, including China, of course, is this um, the result of technology? Oh, and here I'm just showing you um, that China, in spite of what people often think, had a major burst of um, industrialization measured typically, I should have as a share of manufacturing total employment. Um, they had a burst of it around 2003, but it ended by 2013. And since then, China, like India, has been deindustrializing in employment terms. Now, I'm going to disaggregate and explain why, this, why did this happen in industry? How do we explain it? Is it technology led? Um, and to do that, I'm just going to remind you of a few basic economic variables. Um, you need three. First, output here measured as real value added. The pace of the growth of real value added is just the rate of industrial expansion, how fast in volume terms industri industry is um, growing. Uh, second, employment, which is here measured in, and in my book in terms of workers employed, not hours of employment, because we have more general global statistics available for um, the worker data. And then productivity is just the ratio of output to employment. It's just output per worker. Now, this is really important to note that when we talk about labor productivity here, we don't mean marginal labor productivity. We're not talking about what this or that worker contributes to production. We're talking about average labor productivity, total output divided by number of workers. If auto, that's why if automation was taking place and workers were being pushed out of production, we would see that show up in higher rates of average labor productivity growth. So that's really important to the argument. I also use a stylized equation in my book, which I'm gonna talk about a bit more here. I'll give you some examples. It's just that the change in output equals the change in employment plus the change of productivity. It's actually on the first page of the Wealth of Nations. What determines the Wealth of Nations? It's the um, increase in employment plus the increase in uh, the efficiency of labor. Just to give you a few examples of this, imagine we have a car factory. Here I'm re redoing the equation as out growth of output minus growth of productivity equals growth of employment. So what am I talking about? Imagine you have a car factory and output has been growing in the car factory by 3% per year. This factory is just selling 3% or producing 3% more cars every year. But productivity isn't growing at all, it's stagnant. In that case, it would, it would have to be true that employment was growing by 3% per year to explain the growth of output by 3% per year. Contrary wise, in the same auto factory, if um, output were growing by 3% per year and productivity were growing by 3% per year, we wouldn't need any additional workers to get this um, additional growth of output. So three minus three equals zero. And in the other case, three minus zero equals three. Here's what's really going on in the manufacturing sector in the United States um, in the recent decades. So output's been growing by 1% per year. Productivity has been growing by 3% per year. One minus three is negative two. That means that employment in manufacturing has been shrinking by 2% per year. And this is the strong case for the automation account. And you see it repeated across many newspapers and many, um, you know, many articles actually as well, academic articles it says, look, productivity is growing faster than output. And that means that we can have more and more stuff with fewer and fewer workers. This is a technology driven story. If we zoom out a little bit, we get a different perspective. Here's the same data, but presented in now in three time sections, 50 to 73, 74 to 2000, and 2001 to 2017. What you can see is that at least in this rendition, this is the official US numbers, productivity has remained totally steady over time. 
the main trend is not rising rates of productivity growth. It's falling rates of output growth. What that means is that industry, it's not that there's less industrial volume of production than there was before, but the rate at which industry has been expanding has been slowing down. This is a pattern of output led, not productivity led deindustrialization. Now that made it seem like at least productivity has been steady in the US. And this is something a lot of automation theorists have uh, pointed out. But Susan Hausman at the Upjohn Institute disputes this, which she shows that if you disaggregate manufacturing, actually productivity growth has been slowing down in most of the manufacturing sector. It's one, one subsector, computer and electronic products that has seen very high rates of productivity growth, likely due to a mismeasurement issue in um, how uh, statisticians deal with quality changes in manufacturing chip production. If you exclude that subsector, it subtracts 1.7% per year from manufacturing labor productivity growth rates. You'd see a real slowdown in labor productivity growth in manufacturing. That actually makes the US more like its competitors, Germany and Japan. I've highlighted for you here, showing you that productivity growth has really um, fallen in industry in Germany and Japan over these three periods. You might say, oh, that's just because Japan and Germany have caught up to the technological frontier. But remember what I showed you earlier, Japan and Germany are much more heavily roboticized than the US. And unlike the US, they see this pattern of slowing productivity growth in manufacturing. And in fact, I should just say that in the US, the decade of the 2010s that saw this immense um, growth of the automation discourse saw completely flat manufacturing productivity levels, zero productivity growth in the 2010s, even in the US, even according to the official statistics. So what's the pattern that explains the deindustrialization in Germany and Japan? Once again, it's a pattern of long-term decline in output growth rates. It's an output-led process. It's not the pace of automation that's speeding up, that's causing this trend in manufacturing. It's rather that rates of industrial expansion are slowing down. Why? Why is this happening? Well, I'm just going to be able to touch on this here. You can have a look at my book. I'll just point out very quickly that, you know, the period since 1970 has been an era of immense globalization, actually continuing the period of globalization in trade terms that started around 1949, um, and ex as measured here by the rising export share of global GDP. And according to The Economist, this rising export share was going to correspond to um, growing gains from trade, and you know, as countries all over the world specialized in different types of uh, industrial product. What actually happened? Here is the um, growth rate annual of, uh, of manufacturing output for the entire world. This is just the standard OEC, uh, sorry, the standard WTO statistics. And what you can see is this, this pattern of slowing output growth in industry. It's not only a phenomenon in the rich countries, it's a global phenomenon. So output growth rates uh, for industry in real terms have been stagnating across the entire world since the 1960s and 70s to low rates in the 80s, 90s up to today. My argument is that globalization generated more trade redundancies than trade complementarities. What that means is that as productive capacities expanded rapidly worldwide, the result was industrial overcapacity driving down rates of investment and hence also rates of output growth in industry. And that's the cause of deindustrialization. Um, it adds to already existing long-term trends around um, demand elasticities, which we can talk about if you want. That's a more complicated phenomenon. Now here, I'm sort of telling a standard story of the transition from industrial to service-based economy. But what's less frequently talked about when people talk about that transition is that it's been associated with a productivity growth slowdown, an economic growth slowdown, and a persistently low demand for labor. Just to present this again in a very stylized way, um, uh, referring to the US economy, during the heyday of industrial, the industrial economy, productivity growth in core industries was fast, i.e. in industry, but output growth was even faster, resulting in steady job creation. So we saw fast rates of productivity growth, but even faster rates of output growth. And between, in the gap between those two, we saw steady job creation. And that meant that workers over time were moving into high productivity jobs. This is part of the process of structural change. Today, due to much lower rates of output growth, 
what we see is that workers are exiting from these high productivity jobs. These high productivity jobs are seeing steady employment losses. And that puts the former process of structural change into reverse in a certain sense. In services, what we see is that um, since the 50 to 79 period, in services, output is growing at a slower pace in this period than before, but productivity growth is even slower. So once again, jobs are created in the gap between output growth and productivity growth. But here, what's making for the job growth is very low rates of productivity growth. And what that means is that the economy is selecting low productivity jobs for steady employment expansion. What that means is that as this transition is taking place, we've seen steady declines in rates of, um, um, uh, out of um, productivity growth for the economy. This is not what you would expect to see if we were living through an age of um, automation that was rapidly transforming productivity growth rates across the economy. On the contrary, the 2010s was the worst decade for productivity growth, I think across the entire OECD. Um, so this is not core, this doesn't correlate to the story the automation theorists are telling. And likewise, because productivity growth is a major component of output growth for the economy as a whole, we've seen uh, GDP growth rates really falling off over time. And here I'm just comparing the overall growth rate of the economy to um, manufacturing growth rates. MVA is just the output growth rate in manufacturing that I was showing you before. Um, so the result of this has been a persistently low demand for labor. We're just seeing slowing economic growth, harder time creating jobs in the aftermath of the recessions, and that resulting in worsening bargaining positions for workers. Um, and one of the main indicators, of course, is just that across the G7 countries, the labor share of income has been falling. And this is just another version of that story I told you before, another indicator of the general decline in the demand for labor, which, you know, we can talk about, it's not really well captured anymore by the unemployment rate. And I spend a lot of time talking about that in my book. It's really important to note, however, that in a, even if it's true that in a slow growing economy, workers in general face a low demand for labor, who and how differs significantly across countries. So in the book, I refer to the OECD index, which just on a scale of zero to six measures employment protections from dismissal. Um, and what you see is that in the US, uh, workers on this scale, they're hired at will and fired at will. They have very few job protections. Even when they have jobs, they can easily be fired. And that means that all workers in the United States, with the exception of tenured professors and some unionized uh, workers, are just subject to labor market fluctuations. When unemployment rates are high, workers find that they have um, a worse bargaining position and cannot really fight for autonomy and higher wages at work. In other countries, um, especially permanent employees have much stronger protections, uh, especially in Germany and Japan, which I mentioned before, and even more so in Italy and France. And what that means is that for some workers, i.e. permanently employed workers, they can still fight for better conditions and better wages, even when unemployment rates are high. And that's precisely why governments and businesses have worked to make the labor markets more flexible to subject more workers, especially those who lose their jobs and um, new labor market entrants and women re-entering the labor force uh, to um, a much greater degree of insecurity so that they are forced to moderate their demands in relationship to general labor market trends. So just to summarize my account here, what I've talked about so far, is this the end of work? No. The pace of technologically induced destruction is actually not speeding up in spite of what you've heard. In reality, economic growth rates are slowing down and that is reducing the rate at which new jobs are being created. So the summary of my argument here is no, it's not an accelerating pace of job destruction. It is a decelerating pace of job creation that's at the core of the phenomena that the automation theorists are trying to identify. The resulting low demand for labor provides a fundamental backdrop to the expanding digital economy, one that is all too frequently ignored in studies that focus just on technologies and social institutions. This general background phenomenon of the macroeconomic context of stagnation reduces work workers' bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis employers. It affects the costs and benefits of uh, firms' investment decisions. And as a result, workers end up with very little say in how digital work processes are structured across much of the economy. 
Um, now, let me say that in the book, I not only talk about that, I also go on to talk about how governments have tried to respond to this phenomenon, which I really associate with a decline in um, the rate of private investment that's really driving reduced expansion of the economy. It's basically based in um, reduced rate of growth of capacity and capacity utilization. Um, that uh, uh, phenomenon governments have tried to respond to it through Keynesian demand management, which has continued throughout the so-called neoliberal era. In fact, um, debt to GDP ratios have just risen dramatically since the 1970s, they haven't fallen. Um, we've seen that in, um, we've also seen uh, governments turn to neoliberal structural adjustment programs, trying to create labor flexibility, but in the context of a stagnant economy, that has just made workers more insecure. Because even though they take these low wage and insecure jobs, the economy never recovers and strengthens the labor market so that they would be able to improve those conditions. We've just seen workers subjected to even worse conditions. And I also consider proposals for basic income. And I explain why in a stagnant economy, basic income will be subject to the exact same kinds of um, austerity um, uh, concerns as the existing welfare state. It won't resolve these problems. It could only do that if the automation story were true. But since it's not true, um, we have bigger problems, basically. And then at the end of the book, I really talk about um, how we could imagine what I call post-scarcity economy, which is a term that some of the automation theorists use um, without depending on automation to get there. So instead of thinking that, you know, we're living in this age of brilliant technologies that's eradicating work and it's just a distributional question, I say, no, it's really a story about production. We need to change um, production in the sense of providing everyone with universal basic services and basic income so they can be assured of meeting their needs and getting beyond scarcity in that sense and um, doing so in combination with both reducing and redistributing uh, work and making for a world which we can make already with the technologies we have we don't need to wait for automation to create a world where people are fundamentally secure work less have more autonomy in their work um, and can experience real freedom outside of work, no longer just, you know, destroyed by the experience of insecurity that's really endemic to a slow growing economy. So thank you so much for um, uh, listening to my talk. I'm really excited to hear your uh, comments. Again, this was just a very short, compressed version of um, what, I, what I argue in automation and the future of work. So thank you so much. I'm going to stop my slide sharing now. Fantastic. Thanks so much, uh, Aaron, for uh, an excellent and provocative talk and for, for keeping to time and for ending on a, uh, a utopian note as well, rather than the endless techno pessimism, which we, we tend to hear. So um, if attendees would like, um, I'd invite you to turn on your cameras um, so that we can have a more face-to-face uh, uh, -face discussion if possible. Um, if you'd like to ask Aaron a question, you can either write it in the chat uh, or you can use the raise hand function. Um, we have about 25 minutes or so for uh, questions. So um, while we wait for them to come in, oh, Jackie's asked a question actually. So rather than abusing my position, let's oh, go. Oh no, to you go ahead first, Steve. You, you ask the first question. All right, fair enough. Well, um, it seems, Aaron, um, that you align yourself with, with your, your macroeconomic story very much aligns with the sort of Robert Brenner uh, long downturn in, in the global macroeconomy thesis. And you use that in a really interesting way to look at how that uh, macro level story structures labor market um, outcomes. So um, Robert Brenner, amongst a few other people, um, Cedric Durand, Mackenzie Walker and others, seem recently to have aligned on this idea that this long downturn has been going on for so long uh, that we're almost past the point of what you could conceivably call a capitalist economy with functioning labor uh, and other markets whatsoever. So they seem to have come up with various terms for this neo-feudalism, techno-feudalism by which uh, you know, big digital platforms can extract surpluses from people who are more or less at their mercy because of these labor market uh, and macroeconomic dynamics. On the other hand, you have um, perspectives critical of that, I suppose. So uh, I'm thinking of Evgeny Morisov, who recently 
uh, I was reading, arguing that there's actually a lot more dynamism um, left in the capitalist economy, and particularly in the digital uh, and tech sectors than uh, the first set of thinkers I listed uh, would have it. So he says, yeah, okay, there's a lot of oligopoly, but there's still oligopolistic competition between these big uh, digital platforms. Uh, there's a hell of a lot of capitalist investment uh, going on in these sectors. And it could be that we're seeing the inklings, uh, the kind of green shoots of post-COVID recovery in labor market outcomes in the US. So if you log onto Twitter these days, you see signs in shop windows at, you know, begging for workers, uh, offering higher wages and so on. Um, so I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on that. Do you see a long downturn into something that's completely non-capitalist whatsoever? A, a new kind of feudalism with techno uh, lords exploiting us all? Uh, or is there still some life left in the capitalist economy? And are we likely to head back to what we would consider more normal post-war labor markets um, in, in the coming years? Uh, great, so should I go one at a time? Where are you gonna take rounds? Um, yeah, if you could come back on that point, just yeah, while great. and we'll gather a few more questions together. Yeah. I mean, I think that the techno feudalism thesis is totally premature, I guess, in my view. Um, I think we've been, I think what's the core understanding there, which is really important, is that um, the long term uh, decline in investment predates rising inequality, that rising inequality and olig oligopoly and all these kind of things, um, waves of mergers and so on, all of that uh, postdates this general long term trend. And so um, seeing, uh, I think too often Keynesians like try to say that inequality is the cause of slow growth rather than a reaction to it. Um, so I think that, you know, there is this really important trend um, and a lot of the growth of finance has been deeply politicized. All of that's definitely true, but I don't think that um, anything has fundamentally changed in the structure of the economy because we still live in an economy where uh, private investment decisions of uh, very wealthy people determine the size of the economy, whether it grows or shrinks. And to me, that's the core of a definition of capitalism is um, private control over the investment function. And we still have that. Now, even last night, Janet Yellen was, you know, proposing a change in that kind of basic framework and saying, look, we're going to have a lot more public investment. We're going to have uh, investment in research and development. We're going to change labor market dynamics and we're not going to rely on the private sector anymore in the same way to generate jobs and that's an incredible um opening salvo of the post-covid era you know i always feel uncomfortable with that phrase uh, as death rates are very high in um, india and other places around the world so it seems to be very premature to say we're out of this mess but um it's definitely true that in the u.s some leading uh policymakers in the government are trying to make a big shift and i think that that comes actually out of a recognition of this long-term stagnation phenomenon and an effort to put some to some extent public investment in the driver's seat i think it's the only way out um but i think that probably its results will be limited uh, especially because I think there will be a lot of political opposition to it, um, you know, just a standard way to um, public investment-led economies. But I also think that um, that the kind of deeper social structural reasons for slow growth economy will assert themselves over time. We're seeing very crazy labor markets right now. But one of the lessons that I think is really important is to look at the long-term trends. In 2017, 2018, we were hearing all these statements that there was full employment already in the United States, even though wage growth remained low and the Fed was denying that low unemployment rates could any longer be used as an indicator of what's going on. Things are definitely really crazy right now in the US labor market and especially the bottom end workers are benefiting, but we just have to see how things play out. Um, and I just reject the idea that anyone knows what's going to happen. We have a lot of um, dangers ahead, I would say. Excellent, thanks very much. So um, let's take a couple of speakers at a time. So uh, if Jackie, do you want to go first? And then after Jackie, we'll take a question from Brendan Birchall, and then we'll go back to you, Aaron, for uh, answers to these two questions. Jackie? Um, yeah, well, first of all, thank you very much. I thought it was a great talk. I really, my there's two points of clarification. Well, on one hand, I wouldn't disagree with you on the, the quality of jobs people are getting. So. 
especially we saw what's happened to young people in the labour market in the past decades, they're getting increasingly less good quality jobs measured in terms of temporary or part-time work or the rate wage rates sometimes. My question really is that linked to the last point about the starting position that there's been a lack of a, a decline in demand for labour because if we look at, sorry I couldn't help but there's a link here to um, to labour market data, if you look at table figure seven, I can't show my screen, but you'll see that, um, oh, maybe I can, maybe I'm not allowed to, <laughs> we'll do it anyway, never mind, right. If, I mean, if you look at that, this graph here, you can see that from 1870, 1870, 61, in the UK, had about how labour demand or growth of employees has just increased massively, okay, with the dips here around the 70s. So the first question was the clarification of uh, the link to this is in the chat. Mm -hmm. First of all, the question is, has there really been a declining demand for labour? Because the last point you said there was we have seen a lot more people getting into work uh, historically. And a lot of those people are also women have increased massively since the 1980s. So my question is, why are you starting there? Is it you're only referring to people in the manufacturing sector? I, 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 that's one question. And the second quick question is, when you're measuring output rates, you, sh you tell a kind of sad story that the rates are not going up. But is that the right measure that we should be using? Should we be using volume of outputs? Because the volume may be actually increasing, although the rate of growth may not be increasing. If, so it's just a point of clarification on those of why you've chosen these kinds of indicators. Sorry, that's a rather long-winded way of asking that, but thanks. Thanks. Um, uh, are we okay to collect one more from Brendan and then uh, are you okay um, to respond to two together, Aaron? Is that all right? Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, thanks for a great talk. I wish all economists were as clear as you and, and very rich, a lot of detail there. Um, the your main unit was employers rather than ours for reasons you explained to do with the data that you've got. Um, but I wondered what would happen in your model if for whatever reason, maybe because of the shock of COVID, but our tastes or preferences changed. And instead of you're assuming and looking at labor power here in terms of the pressure for wage growth, for instance, if a, there was a much stronger preference for people to reduce their hours, if um, people realised that um, working shorter hours, say, you know, a four day week uh, was not only uh, preferable, you know, in terms of their lifestyle, but was also seen as, you know, high status and so on. Um, yeah, what would that do to your models if suddenly that preference shifted from increasing wages to reducing hours? Great. So I'll just, um, I'll just answer these. Uh, in order. So thank you very much for these questions. So um, to uh, Jackie's questions up first on um, jobs quality, is there really a decline in the demand for labor? Um, so one of my other big research project has been around the history of unemployment and especially the construction of unemployment rates. And I think it's just really important to see that, um, you know, the long history of um, the construction of unemployment rates actually going back not to the beverage report in 42 but his first big book about unemployment in 1909 was the recognition that um you know the the standard problem workers face is not unemployment which tends to just be associated with the business cycle but a phenomenon that he called actually following charles booth uh, there's a great english history of all of this stuff chronic underemployment and so those kind of that kind of experience of workers of chronic underemployment really can't be measured just by the growth in the number of jobs, right? We, we can't simply look at the unemployment rate to measure what's going on with the demand for labor. In fact, what my research on unemployment shows is that actually the unemployment rate is only a good proxy for the demand for labor when there's relatively full employment. It's only when labor markets are kind of running hot for a long time that the unemployment rate is actually a good approximation of the unused labor capacity in the system. When we have chronically stagnant uh, labor markets, what we find is that more and more workers uh, find work, but the work is of low quality, and then they continue their job search even while they're 
employed. And you really see that that was a main thing that the Fed um, noted in 2019 when they said we can no longer use the unemployment rate to understand labor demand um, because so many workers have jobs and are looking for work. And I think that, you know, that is also, um, that's why to me, the main indicator that we need to look at is actually the labor share of income. And, um, you know, that kind of um, uh, comes to another question from uh, Simon that I'll come to in a moment. But, you know, I think that um, that labor share of income is not due to changes in the marginal productivity of capital and labor and substitution elasticities of substitution. It's due to a much more general phenomenon of um, weak growth rates. And, you know, especially I think the contribution of a growing labor supply of women entering the labor market. In the United States, it's well understood that women enter the labor market because uh, to some extent, or many in many households, uh, the stagnation of men's uh, wages, real wages, pushed many women into the labor market to try to preserve income growth um, over the course of the life cycle of families. Um, it was a response to stagnation, right? And actually, in many European countries, it was the opposite response. Um, they, in, in countries like France and Germany, they tried to prevent women from entering the labor market because there were so few jobs. And you saw a lot of kind of policies in that direction. So in general, that's why I'm saying we need to look at a range of other statistics to identify this phenomenon, not just the growth of employment or the unemployment rate, but also the labor share of income, attempts to measure underemployment and so on. Um, as for the uh, growth rates versus levels question, you know, I think that um, the levels are what really matters if what we're talking about is well-being, right? Like how much we can produce, what kind of needs we're able to meet. Those are in a lot of ways, absolute figures that matter. Um, and that's led a lot of people to question like, why do we even care about the GDP growth rate? Like, why is that a key statistic? It's a really bad measure of well-being to just look at the rate of growth. But that's a mistake in understanding what these growth rates measure. They're not about well-being. They're the fundamental measures of um, the stability of the economy. The growth rate of the economy and the growth rate of productivity and employment, those basic, the interaction between those growth rates, when you add also like the inflation rate and a few other ones, um, tell you about the social stability of the economy. When the economy isn't growing quickly and there's a low demand for labor, more of GDP growth goes to wealthy households and asset owners and away from workers. And so the GDP growth rate is no longer a good measure of like what's going on across the economy because of um, rising inequality. So that's why these rates matter. They don't matter in absolute terms. Like what matters, as you said, is just the absolute levels of volume, but the rate of growth of these volumes, and these are all in real terms. So they're rates of growth of volume. Um, that really matters when we're thinking about social stability. Um, on the question of preferences for work reduction, definitely that would make a huge difference. And I'm really impressed by and watching campaigns for four day weeks um, in a number of European countries and of course in the UK as well. I think that's really important. I, would, I don't really think that we should think of those campaigns simply in terms of people's preferences shifting. I think there's a lot more at stake there. And you know, when you look at the opposition to campaigns for four day week, you just won't see people saying, this isn't the preference set, you know, this isn't the, what we discover to be the preferences that people have. People prefer to work long hours. No one says that, it's not about preferences. It's about fundamental conflicts in the economy and the strength of labor and the strength of employers. The four day week would massively reduce the supply of labor and shift power towards workers in a way that is incredibly uh, dangerous for, you know, for private investors looking to make investment decisions. And they will reasonably say, we will not invest in an economy like this. And that will, you know, that will cause social instability. And, and that's because we still live in an economy where private investment decisions, private control over the investment function determines whether the economy grows or shrinks. It determines the size of the economy. And that means that private employers have immense power to block those kinds of policies from coming into place regardless of what the revealed preferences are of working people. So I'm a really big fan of work reduction. I think it has to be paired with changes in the quality of work as well. Um, but I expect that to be a major fight and not to come easily 
whatever surveys say about whether people want to reduce their work or not. But thank you so much for um, these questions. I think they're really, really important. Excellent. Um, I'd like to bring in Simon uh, Deacon. Simon, do you want to briefly introduce yourself before you uh, ask your question? And then after Simon... No, who's Simon uh, Deacon? Is. I've read your work. I'm a really big fan, so no need for introductions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, and after, sorry, after Simon, can we go to uh, Astrid, just so that you're, you're ready, Astrid? Um, thanks very much. I, I know we're short of time, so I'll be as quick as possible. I, it, it seemed to me, Aaron, that your, your slide about the OECD um, employment protection indicators does show that uh, the political economy of, of this matters and, and, and you know, actually legal institutions matter. And I think a good explanation for labor getting weaker and capital getting stronger would be changes to, to make that so. Now, I, I know an economist would say, well, why did the law change? There must be some deeper force. Sure, but but the, it seems to me that if you if you if you do make labour more flexible um, and capital is given additional rights, which is what corporate governance reform has largely been about, eventually um, labour will start replacing capital because labour is cheaper than capital in relative terms, and and we see this in the UK in this debate about capital shallowing. I know that the uh, corporate governance lobby would argue that capital flows will increase if we give shareholders more rights. But in fact, the hurdle rate is well above the interest rate and arguably the cost of capital has been increasing recently, not going down. Uh, that's why we see uh, labor piling up in low productivity jobs. And we also see the capital which should be devoted to investment going into things like asset price booms and artificially frittered away in things like uh, the sort of thing that led to the, 20, the 2008 global financial crisis. It seems to me that really what explains much of this is, is the political economy of it. And, and this would imply that it can perfectly well be reversed. And it doesn't seem to have a lot to do with technology. Technology is something which follows from the political economy, I would suggest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. That's um, really great and really important part of the story. Um, and, you know, as someone who's worked in like the archives of the OECD and has tracked this exact transformation in their views um, from, you know, support being the biggest supporters of uh, fast growing economies with uh, full employment to advocating, of course, like, you know, the OECD job study really advocating for um, flexibilization of labor. I just, in my view, it's impossible to understand why that's happened without seeing that what happens first is starting in the 70s, a decline in rates of investment, slowing growth of the economy and jobless recoveries, and that all of these proposals around labor flexibilization were responses to that pre-existing trend. The argument was stated so clearly in the OEC documents, especially from the 1980s, we cannot get out of this rut of stagnation we're in, which they already identified in the early 80s. The only thing we can do is make labor more flexible, push down wage growth below rates of productivity growth. They actually said, we're going to open up the gap between wages and productivity to push workers into bad jobs. And once that's completed, that structural adjustment to the economy will create the conditions for a new era of growth. It never showed up, right? And it's definitely true that you know we can reverse that. And I think we're starting to see that at least policy, in, you know, people talking about doing that in the US. But I don't think that on its own, that policy change will generate the results because you can't turn back the clock of time. You can't restore uh, European, for example, or US export competitiveness on the global market because we just live in a much more complex and interrelated global economy with many more players and hence, fewer opportunities for rapid export growth. That's why I think that in the US, smart policymakers like Janet Yellen know that changing the policy framework can't happen unless they can put public investment in the driver's seat because profit rates are just gonna remain far too low, especially if we're further reducing profit rates by pushing on the profit share of income. I, I don't believe in the kind of, um, neoclassical stories about capital labor substitution. I don't think that's based in any kind of reality, but what's based in reality is the idea that um, pushing down wage rates below productivity, raise profit rates and create more um, opportune environments for private investment. Uh, the reverse of that, policies that improve the strength of labor will also reverse the profit share. 
making it harder for private companies to invest. There's no way to get things off the ground without more public investment. And what we need to see then is not just public investment, but democratic control. And I'll just add here my view that I don't believe that we live in a world where trusting technocratic experts to make the right decisions about public investment is gonna be a winning strategy. Only if these are more democratic decisions are we gonna see people actually trust the process. We live in a world where trust in experts is very low. Thanks very much, Aaron. So um, we have uh, Astrid and then um, if we could follow immediately on from Astrid to Ben, who, who Ben Roberts, who has his hand up and those, those uh, Two will be the final questions, I think, so that we can wrap up on time. So first of all, Astrid, and then straight to Ben. Yeah, thank you very much, Aaron. Um, this was a very interesting talk. Um, very much, uh, yeah, I'm very happy having you here in this uh, digital debate series because I'm working a lot on um, automation and its impact on inequality. And um, I have two questions, and I think you've already answered some part of it uh, when you are answering to Simon's question. Um, so the first one is if you could say something about the impact on capital productivity, because the equation you mentioned just focuses on labor productivity and it's only equal. I mean, uh, the change in output is only equal to the change in employment and the change in the pro productivity if, um, yeah, if labor productivity is productivity. And um, the other question relates to global value chains. So what we know, for example, from the OECD and other studies is that um, in the recent decades, we had um, a slowdown in global value chains. And uh, we know um, that um, trade as well for en enhancing, it's about the distribution of <laughs> common economists. So um, it's about the distribution of the additional um, income of the gains and how we distribute it across um, different uh, populations and economies. And um, so um, what about, what do you think about this issue? <laughs> I could yeah. see from your mimics, but um, so, um, because I, I heard you saying something about um, global value chains and the part they could play in, in, in growth. And um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, as an economist, I have to yeah, yeah. on the relationship in global value chains, how important it is that they function well and increase our trade among different economies and um, have this impact on additional growth. And then the question is, what do you think, how much impact has played in the past decades? Um, yeah, <laughs> for this problem we have on, on with um, yeah, employment. Fantastic, thanks Astrid. Can we bring in Ben quickly and then we'll go back to Aaron to sum up. Uh, yeah, I guess it's a question, it's sort of less about um, economics and more about the automation discourse. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, as you've pointed out, a lot of that around at the moment, particularly, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of some of the utopian stuff, uh, Sanacek and Williams and Bastani, you've got on, you're actually endorsing the back of your book, I noticed. So, but those utopian visions are very much based around the technological thesis that you are kind of rejecting, right? So I wonder if you could say something about that, how you're hanging on to this utopian vision um, uh, in the light of not, not in fact agreeing with the thesis about automation. Great, that'll give me a great opportunity to close on that actually. So um, first Astrid, sorry, I was sort of, you know, giving you the, the sign when, I, when you were giving your second question. Um, first, just on capital productivity. Again, you know, lots of confusion here, whether we're talking about marginal or average capital productivity. But, you know, I think if you're just talking about average capital productivity, what you see, again, is a long term decline um, that's been associated with reduced capacity utilization rates. And, um, you know, yeah, in general, like falling rates of growth of output relative to current cost of capital. So it's really the fall in the capital productivity level, uh, growth rates, or sorry, in, it's in the fall in capital productivity growth that is like really at the core of um, the story I'm telling. And there's some great papers on this, on the long-term stagnation of um, capital uh, productivity across the G7 economies. I think that needs to be taken a lot more seriously. As for, you know, trade enhancing growth, I mean, I just think that the, the number of simplifying assumptions about, you know, 
There aren't many different types of medium income economies. And the fact that there's a massive amount of FDI, that we live in a world economy with huge global imbalances that structure the economy, just show that the stories people tell about this just need empirical verification. There's a huge amount of evidence that um, you know, the, the growth of trade just hasn't worked out the way that economists are saying. Does that mean that I'm going to sit here and say, you know, that we should be rolling back global value chains and returning production to high income countries? No, because, you know, that we have to, we can't live in a world where manufacturing capacity is really localized in rich countries who are exporting it to poor countries. The whole story I'm telling here could be retold as a story about the new international economic order and the fights in the 1970s about multinational companies and the global management of those companies. So I think that there's a really big story there um, about global value chains, which obviously I don't have time to get into. Um, as far as Ben's question, I mean, yeah, I am saying that's how the book started as a project was reading these kinds of utopian accounts of what will be possible and how we can live in a world that's no longer so centered on work identities with automation. That was like the big impetus for writing this book because I knew that they were wrong about the empirical trends. And so my question was, I sort of conceived of the book as a love letter to, if, if I might say so, to all of these different automation theorists to kind of say, the, the, the world you wanna live in is great. That is a great goal for a world, but we can't get there by depending on technology. And in fact, in my view, there's a long history of what I call the post-scarcity tradition, which has always claimed that given technologies that we have, even if those technologies aren't automating, they could be used to produce a better world. And that goes back you know, really far to Thomas More. It's also a key claim of John Stuart Mill about um, what we can do when we approach the stationary economy, claims that Keynes picked up, claims that were repeated by W.B. Du Bois and John Dewey among others, um, and many you know, socialists as well, uh, that given our current advanced technologies, we could choose to live in a world where we provide people with basic income and basic services so they can meet their needs and not be insecure. I think economists have not taken into account in the way that psychologists have how psychologically damaging and how damaging for people's lives insecurity is, how fundamental security is for being able to live a good life. Um, and I think we can produce a world like that, even facing climate change. It just means living in a world where private control over investment is no longer um, given the power that it is today. And that raises a lot of questions about what the economy will look like, how innovation will work, how people will be motivated. Uh, and that's really um, something that I'm gonna talk about in uh, my next book about post-scarcity economics. So thank you so much for having me. These were great questions. It's really great to talk to you. Can't wait to come back to Brighton. Maybe there's some way that uh, I'll get there, you know, with the changing European regime. So sorry we didn't have time to talk more, but I hope to see you all one day in person uh, in the post-COVID era. So thank you so much. Fantastic. Thanks again, Aaron, for ending on such a, an optimistic note. Um, I hope people are able to join us again next week. This is a regular series of talks. Uh, next week we have Professor Xialan Fu who is going to talk about Chinese video apps uh, and how sellers from across the world are video uh, beaming themselves into china and selling their their products um, and how this is changing the global development landscape 